And uh, we bought them and placed them in our bedroom. Uh, it looks really good. It's all white, very simple. And it has, in total, it has 10 drawers. And uh, my wife allocated two drawers just for me, and the rest is for her, for sure. And just kidding. Uh, as months pass, um, we realize that how come the, the clothing there becomes, you know, fuller and fuller? Like, we, we didn't realize that we move some clothing from our wardrobe to that tall boy uh, because, j- simply because it's really easy to access. And, you know, it's really easy near the door. And, and without we realize it, until one day, each time of the thin board that supports each drawer started to give up and all the, all the clothing, because we keep squeezing, squeezing the drawer with, with T-shirt, with shirt, with undergarment, uh, whatever it is. And then, and then it started to break, and then that caused a lot of havoc. That caused a lot of chaos and uh, extra work for me to fix it, extra stress for me to fix it. And we all experience that, you know, when we squeeze something until, until it reaches its limit, it's going to break. That's the same with our lives. I know that each one of us have a wardrobe, and there are two groups of people here. The first group is if your wardrobe looks like this, it's really tidy, it's really organized, but based on each color, black will be here, white will be here, all the shoes are really tidy and everything, really organized, and you are that kind of person. If you're that kind of person, I applaud you for that. And the, the next group of, pers- group of people is those who have wardrobe like this. Really? Well, yeah, which is most of us, that's right. <laughs> and, and why don't we just make that as a resolution this year to tidy up our wardrobe, shall we? But you know what? And for us, uh, that's not a big deal, Mike. That's not a big deal. That's right. It's not really a big deal. It's not a problem for us to have that kind of wardrobe. But unfortunately, it's not okay for us to have life, to, to have our life to look that way, to have our relation, relationship in, is in a mess like that, to have our financial st- situation in our lives to look like that. So we, we started last week with with a series to open, um, with the sermon with, to open squeezed. And Pastor Daniel gave us a definition of squeezed. It says, he said, you know you are squeezed when you have no space between your current load and your limit. We, are, we, we all have limits. Financial limit, emotional limits, time limits. And life is better when you are not squeezed. Life is much better when you have margin, when you have breathing space, when you have a chance where you can say, I don't have to be stressed because of my finance. I don't have to be stressed because we are fighting all the time. No, we need margin in our lives. We know and realize that life is better when we have space, when we are not squeezed. When you are squeezed, you are stressed. When you are squeezed, you have anxiety. When you are squeezed, your relationship will suffer. You know, maybe your children said, Mom, how come you're always on the phone? Dad, how come you're always on your computer? You always argue about money. I feel like your body is here, but your brain is not here. I don't think you're listening, husband. I don't think you're listening, wife. I don't think you're listening, son. We're all going to experience relationships suffering every single time we have life that is squeezed. Every single time we don't have margin in our lives. When you are squeezed in, your, squeezed in your schedule, when you are squeezed financially, when you are squeezed emotionally, rela- relationships suffer. But it's so easy for us to blame other things, to blame other people, to blame our work, to blame the pressure that we had at work. But at the end of the day, we were created to have margin. You may not be a church person here. Maybe someone invited you. Believe it or not, this ancient book, that you don't read because you're scared of it. The Bible speaks a lot of things about us having margin. If you, if you have known the story of Israel, the nation of Israel, God chose Israel to be representative of Him in this world. And the Israelites were, uh, were in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, in Egypt. They didn't have any law, they didn't have any rules, but when God chose them, take them out of slavery, God gave them rules. 
And the rules is not to burden them, but the rules actually to, to make them prosper, to make them uh, have a new lifestyle. And, and God gave them 600 commandments in total. And there are top 10. And one of the top 10 commandments, you know it as 10, 10 commandments. Number four, he gave a commandment for the Israelites to take a day off. You got to love a God who commands you to take, to take a day off, right? In the very beginning, God already said to Israelites, I have designed you to function better, to function best when there's a room to breathe, when you're not squeezed. So when the sun goes down, stop working for 24 hours on the Sabbath day. When the sun goes down, you don't pick another grain, you don't pick another grape, you don't pick another olives. You just go home and rest. It's my law because I designed you, I designed every one of us to function better when we are not squeezed when we have margin. And today we're going to talk especially about time and your schedule. But before we continue, why don't we just pray one more time and and surrender to God the next few minutes into His hand. Heavenly Father, thank you for designing us in such a way that you want us to have margin in our life. You want us to have margin emotionally, financially, and also in time. As, As we talk about time today, I pray that all of us here will, will open our hearts, open our, open our minds, so that you will be able to speak to us personally. In Jesus' name, amen. My inclination and your inclination is to cramp everything, put everything in our schedule, and never take out. My inclination and your inclination is, is to do so much in our life, to do so much at work, you know, uh, hobbies, that we don't enjoy very much what we do because everything is so cramped, just like this calendar. This is a student's calendar and then in, in her room, and it looks like this, and it was like, what? I can't stand it anymore. I can't really enjoy studying. I can't really enjoy working because everything is so cramped. I'm so squeezed. And here's how you know that you're in trouble in your schedule. You say a lot of, a lot of this. I think I'm going to be late 15 minutes. I might, I might have to leave a few minutes early. Uh, or maybe you drive too fast. Maybe you eat in the car. Maybe you uh, make, do makeup in the car. You just go, 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 go. And when you're at work, you're thinking, I really need to be at home with my children. When you're at home, you're thinking, I really need to be working right now. And if you're single, you just can't say no to people who ask you for things. And, and you just say yes, and then you... Ask yourself, why did I commit to this? And then you, you, you're too afraid to back off. That's why you have a life full of stuff, cramped with stuff. And today we're going to talk about how to solve that. And if this is not happening to you at the moment, we're, we're going to learn how to keep this from happening in your life. We're going to talk about one thing, one big idea, one application, and that I believe it's going to change your life And it's going to change my life. And the reason it can change my life, because it can change your time. It can change your schedule. And I don't know if you know this, that your time is your life. Your time is your life. As your time goes, so goes your life. As your schedule goes, so goes your life. We're going to learn from the Bible. We're going to get a pearl of wisdom from a very famous Old Testament character. And his name is Moses. If you have your Bible or you have, you have your Bible on your phone, open your Bible to Psalm 90. That's where we're going to study today. Psalm chapter 90. For those who don't know Moses, and maybe those of you who are Christian and you know Moses since you were, you know, kid, um, we all know that Moses actually wrote this psalm. And we, when we talk about psalm, we all think about David because David is a psalmist. Just like what my wife said before, Psalm 23, really famous. But this psalm particularly was written by Moses. Moses was 120 years old when he wrote this psalm. And he had all the wisdom, you know. He had all the experience, the bitter and sweet of life. He had experienced it throughout the 120 years. He had four life stages at least. The first life stage when he was a baby... He was adopted by Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. So he became 
he became the, the prince of Egypt. He became the prince of Egypt. Even though he was a Hebrew, he was a uh, Hebrew Israelite, but he was taught to be an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. He walked like an Egyptian. He lived in luxury. I bet that he got big screen TV all over his house, all, all the luxury cars in his life. And when he was in his late teens or early 20s, he just realized, hey, I'm a Hebrew. I'm not an Egyptian. And, and all the Hebrews that I know in my world are actually slaves. And I f- I'm fed up with the way Egyptians treat my fellow brothers. And you know what? He actually killed an Egyptian who, who mistreated an Israelite. And that goes the problem. That comes the problem. He killed another one, and then he ran. He became a fugitive. He ran away from the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian army, and he went to the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he found a family, and he worked in that family. Eventually, he became part of that family. He married one of the daughters of the, the owner of that farm, and he became a shepherd in his early 20s. And let me tell you, for the next 40 years of his life, 40 of his prime years, he became a shepherd. Moses went from one extreme, prince of Egypt, to become a shepherd for 40 years. I'll let you to, I'll let, I'm, I'm, I want you to pause for a while and let 40 years to sink into your mind. 40 years. You know what? Moses didn't need a watch because as a shepherd, as the sun goes up, he goes out with the, with the sheep. As the sun goes down, he sleeps with the sheep. And as the sun goes up, he goes again. As the sun goes down, he, he comes back again. And you know what? It becomes a routine, routine for the next 40 years of his life. And he thought, you know what? I have no purpose, no God, no nothing. I'm just going to wait here until I die. I'm going to have children. I'm going to have grandchildren. And then I'm going to die. My life is over. 40 years of nothing. Until one day, God come to him, he came, he came, God came to him and said, actually, I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And he brought Moses out of the wilderness. And this is the part of the story that you, that, that you are familiar with. God took him to Egypt. And, and he said, let my people go to Pharaoh. Let the Israelites go. And, and the Pharaoh actually said no for a few times. And then he changed his mind after, after many dramatic things happened in Egypt. And then Moses became really famous. He became the hero of the Israelites. He took Israel nation out of Egypt, and, and he became a, a common household name. Maybe, one of you, or maybe you, your name is Moses as well, because of this person was, was doing what God wants him to do. And after the Israel went out of Egypt, God said to Moses, you know what, Moses, because of their stubborn, stubbornness, I will let Israel to go around in the desert for another 40 years. So Moses, on, the, his, on his uh, last stage of his life, he went around the desert for 40 years with complaining people, with stubborn people, uh, stubborn Israelites, and he said, oh man, God, I have enough. And God said, you know what? Before they enter the, the, the promised land, they will go around for 40 years. And just about he reached his 120 years old, God said to him, Moses, we're about to enter the promised land, but you cannot go in. I want you to have a look from far, from the, from the hill, and you cannot go in. God, and, and Moses said, that, that is not nice, God. That is not nice. But I'm telling you, Moses, throughout his 120 years, he has perspective about time. He has perspective, wisdom about time, and we're going to learn from him. And you know what? You don't have to be a Christian you don't have to be a religious person. You don't have to even believe Moses, a historical character. But I hope as the result of today's talk, as today's our time together here, some of you may pick up your Bible and actually read it. Because so many beautiful things, so many awesome insights that you can get from this book. You don't have to believe the Bible. It's true to be able to read it. I want you to read it. Maybe you said, but I don't think it's true. I don't think, I, I, I don't think it's the truth. What do you read that you believe it's true? Nothing. You don't read because you believe it's true. You read things to decide whether it's true or not, right? 
So why in the world you never pick up the Bible and read it? So I just want to encourage all of you, if, you're, if you, this is your first time here, I just want to encourage you to, to, to start reading it. And, and you don't have to believe it. Just keep reading it until you find something interesting for you. The psalm Moses wrote is so insightful. I hope that at the end of our time together, you're going to be in awe of what he said about time. Psalm 90, verse 1. Let's dig in. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. He was talking about the Israelites. God has been faithful generation to generation. Verse 2. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From eternity to eternity, you are God in the middle. Between everlasting and everlasting, there was me, Moses said. Between everlasting to everlasting, there was Michael, there was each one of us, and, and we are like in between of everlasting, eternity. And you know what? The book ends of our lives is not our birth and our death. The book ends of our lives is actually everlasting to everlasting with God in the middle. In the middle. Verse 3, you turn people back to dust saying, return to dust, you mortals. This is where Gandalf actually got the, the words, actually from the Moses prayer in Psalm 19, verse 3. Return to dust, you mortals. God turned people back to dust, Moses said. No matter how cool you are, no matter how popular you are, how, no matter how rich you are, no matter how famous you are, at the end of our lives, God says, return to dust, you mortal." You know what, this is a little offensive for us with modern thinking, but it's not to Moses. This was Moses' way of saying that God controls the beginning and the end of our lives. Do you think that God controls the length of your lives? Do you think that He controls how many days you have remaining in this world? For most of us, whether you can explain it or not, we somehow believe that God controls the length of our lives. If you found out tomorrow that you have a terminal disease, would you pray? If someone you love has a terminal disease, would you pray? And regardless, if you haven't prayed for a long, long time, there's something in you that believes that somehow I know in my heart that God has something to do with the number of days I have in my life. Verse 4. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. A watch in the night. Back in, the, in those days, soldiers who watch over a city, when they watch the city over the night, uh, like in the evening, they have three to four hour shift, each person, to, to watch over the city on the city gate. So Moses said, for God, a thousand years is like one, like a watch in the night, which is three hours. So in God's perspective, 1,000 years for us is like three hours. 1,000 years is like three hours. Think in, this, in these terms. How long is our life? Maybe we can reach 70, 80 if we are strong enough. But in God's perspective, 1,000 years is like three hours for Him. Your life, my life is like like a click, like a beep, a small beep in God's contact. And, God, and Moses said, I want you to hang on with me because this is where our discussion about time starts. This is where our discussion about time and how we manage our time is going to start. Verse 5. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but in the evening it is dry and withered. Now he's saying from the perspective, from eternity everlasting to everlasting, from eternity to eternity, this is what a person's life is like. It's like a, a grass that grows in the morning but die in the afternoon. Our life is like a click, it's like a beep, like a bleep in God's perspective. But Moses' point is not this. He's not saying that, you know what, your life doesn't really matter. So, just do whatever you like with your life because 
And after all, we just dust to dust. After all, we just ashes to ashes. That's not his point. But his point is, your life is so brief. My life is so brief. I just, I just believe that because I just thought that I was only 20 maybe yesterday, but now I'm 33, 32. Like so quick like that. And your life, my life is so common. Your life, my life is so quick because the truth is, we don't really have enough time. Verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Aren't you glad that you are in church and hear this very encouraging news that our lives, the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. Thank you, Moses, for that. But you know what? It is true. It is true that this life, 70 or 80 years of our lives are filled with troubles and sorrows. And the, the master of troubles and sorrow is this person called Moses. 40 years doing nothing as a shepherd, 40 years doing, going around in the desert and people are complaining, complaining and cursing Moses. Why did you take us out of Egypt? You know what, even though we were slave, but we were full. We could eat whatever we want. You... Take us back there, Moses, you know, complaining people, stubborn people. And you know what? And Moses said, okay, I don't want you to compare your trouble with me because my trouble is way more than what you have. But his point about this verse, verse 10, is time in life passes really quick, really quick, really quick. Verse 11, if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as, as great as the fear that is your due. This is a really, really hard verse to understand, right? It sounds like uh, someone who don't understand grammar like me. And, uh, what, and let me tell you, it's actually a very difficult Hebrew verse to translate. But today, let me tell you what, it's actually, what it actually means instead of what actually it says. To make it easy for us to understand, let us paraphrase it and make it, if we could understand, if we could see God as He is, we would give Him the reverence He is due. 1,000 years for God, for us, is like three hours for God. My life is not even a fraction of a second in God's perspective. So quick, just like that. Wow, if we could see God as He is, we would give him the reverence. You know, in the midst of his magnitude, of his greatness, creating the whole world, creating our, um, our body, our, our, our world, you know, in the midst of that, we are amazed with who he is. If we just see God as he is, we would give him the reverence he is due. Or in other words, talking about time, if we could see God as he is, we would be more careful with the time given to us. If we can see that God, the creator of heaven and earth, God, who, whom 1,000 years for us is three hours for him, very quick, our life is like a blip. But for God, if we see him as who he is, we will be more careful about the time that God has entrusted to us. I don't know how many more years I have in this world. And no one of us know how many more years you have, how many more days you have, how many more summer. How many more winters you have in this life? But you know what? If we could see God as He is, we would be more careful with the time that was given to us. So, Moses concludes with this verse in verse 12. And this is one of my favorite verse ever. And he said this, Teach us to number our days. Everybody say, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. After all that, after all that saying that, God, if we see you as who you are, we will be more careful about how we live, how we use our time that you've given to us. So teach us, teach us, God, because we don't know how. God, teach us because it's not natural for us. God, teach us to live as if our days are numbered. Teach us to live as if, our days are limited. Our weeks are limited. The truth is this. We live as if our time is unlimited. 
The truth is, we live as if our kids are going to be with us forever. We live as if, we spend time as if we're always going to have our parents. We're always going to have our mother, our mother-in-law, father-in-law, father. We, we thought that we were going to have them forever in our lives. We spend our time as if we were always going to have each other, husband and wife. And we spend our time as if our time is unlimited. Even though we know it's not true, but in the way we do our schedule, in the way we manage our time, we live as if our days are not limited. We live as if our life, our days are not numbered. But Moses said, Michael, rockers, you need to learn to live as if your days are numbered. If you're a woman and you're married or used to, used to be married, you did this. You did numbering your days because you had a wedding day. And from the time you knew that what day you were going to, to get married, you begin to number your days. You begin to count your days. You begin to plan for your wedding. From the day you said, I will, until you say, I do, the interval of time you start planning of what's going to happen because the day will come. That is your wedding day. The, your plan, you, you plan in the light of the fact that there's a time period between I will and I do and this period will come to an end, and that end is actually my wedding day. If you, if you ever study for exam, they told you the exam is going to be on the 22nd of February, and you said, wow, I have another four weeks, six weeks for me to study. And if you are a good, pre- a good student, you're going to say, I'm going to plan my study to be able to, so, so that I can pass or so, so that I can have high distinction on this exam. So you plan because there's a deadline. You plan because there's a cutting date. Whether you are preparing for a presentation, whether you're preparing for a um, job interview, you are numbering your days. You know how to number your days. I know how to number my days, especially when we're about to have a holiday. You know, you're, you're actually marking your calendars. Oh, two more weeks until we reach uh, the, the beach in Hawaii. Oh, two more weeks until we, we can go to massage every day. Oh, two more weeks, honey. Yeah. So excited. You're counting down and you're numbering your days. And Moses said, what if you live like that? Not only numbering, because, numbering your days because you have wedding, because you have exam, because you have holiday, because you are in holiday, about to end the holiday and you can't wait. Uh, you, you really want to enjoy the holiday, so that's why you don't want the days to pa- go past really quick. quick. And you said, Mo- Moses said, what if you live that, like that? That is not depressing, but it's actually the reality. It's going to help us to do a better job in this life. God, we don't know when we're going to die. And there's so much about you, God, that I don't understand. That's why, teach us, O oh God, to number our days, to live as if our days are numbered. And the verse continues. Teach us that, the result of that teaching is this. Teach us so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to live as if our days are numbered because in living as if our days are numbers, numbered, we will gain wisdom. We will know what we should put into our schedule. We will know what we should leave out of our schedule. We will know how to prioritize if we just number our days. When you begin to number your days, you, be, you immediately gain wisdom. You immediately, immediately gain a perspective that, hey, my time is limited. My time is limited. Wait a minute, I cannot spend my time doing that. Wait a minute, I need to do more of that to be able for me to, to have a quality of life. Hey, I, I need to stop doing that. I need to stop meeting that person because my time is limited. Suddenly, when you start living as if your days are numbered, you gain a wisdom. You gain a new perspective. You gain a new perspective. To summarize what Moses has been talking about in Psalm 90, I want you to remember this bottom line. Remembering our time is limited provides us with wisdom to know how we spend 
our limited time. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Remembering our time is limited provides us with wisdom to know how we spend our limited time. Or to make it even more simple, my time is limited, so I need to limit how I spend my time. My time is limited, so I need to limit how I spend my time. When it comes to money, we understand this. You know, that our money is limited so that I need to really plan for what, how I spend my money. But when it comes to time, we forget that our time is limited, which means I need to limit how I spend my time. Some of you, I know what you're thinking right now. Okay, how much more time you're going to take to, to deliver this sermon, Michael? Uh, hurry up. I need to go home right now. Honey, before the closing prayer, we need to go back to the car and really rush because this is take too long. You're just repeating yourself. But what I'm going to do today before we end is to give you a favor. To give you a favor because I want to take all of you to fast forward your life to the last moments of your life. I want to introduce you to a person named Bronnie Ware. Bronnie Ware is an Australian nurse. She's an Australian nurse, and she spent most of her time with men and women in their last in the last 12 weeks of their lives. She worked in hospice. For, so for many years, she has spent time with people who had about 12 weeks to live, and she stayed with them all the way through till the end. So some time ago, she began to ask these people who have 12 weeks to live questions, and he wrote it in her journal and eventually became her, a book. And in many cases, as she writes in her book, do you have any regrets? So she asked those people, do you have any regrets? Can you tell me your regrets are? She found a pattern and began to write these things down. So today, I want to help you, just like what I said, to fast forward your life, to get a perspective that you won't get any other way. So I want to share you top two regrets that people had within the last 12 weeks, in some cases, the last few days or the last few hours of their lives, and they come up with this understanding with this wisdom. Regret number two. I'm going to come, uh, I'm going to do regret number two first. And it says, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Nothing new here, right? How many times have we heard that? I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I want to read a statement that she made about this insight. She said, this came from every male patient that I'm nursed. Every single man at, at the end of of their life said, I wish I had not worked so hard. They miss their children's youth and their par partner's companionship. Women also spoke of this regret, but as most were from an, an older generation, many of the female patients had not been breadwinners. All of the men I nursed deeply regretted spending so much of their lives on the treadmill of their work existence. Do you know what this means? If we don't learn to number our days, we will misspend our time and we will have an avoidable regret. Because when you think that you have all the time in the world until your health gives up, suddenly you think, oh, I don't have much more time in this world. And then only regrets that comes. You only get 20 once, just like what Pastor D said. You only get 30 once. You only get 40 couple of times. You only get, you get to 50 indefinitely, like forever. For those of you who are in the 50s, you, you don't want to say that you're 60 or 70, you're 50 plus, right? These are the stages of life you cannot go back to, you cannot undo, because these are, uh, these men and women who are numbering their days, I have two more days to live, and these are the wisdom that I have. I wish I didn't work so hard. Regret number one. This is for me, for everybody in this, in this room, especially those who are in high school, in high school, in university, in TAFE, young adult, you need to tune in to this. This is very interesting. This is very true. Regret number one, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expect of me. Brownie, Brownie said this, this was the most common regret of all. When people realize that their lives is almost over and look back clearly on it, it's easy to see how many dreams had gone unfulfilled. Most people had not honored even half of their dreams and had to die knowing that it was due to choices that they made or not made. 
This is so powerful. Health brings a freedom very few realize until they no longer have it. Health brings a freedom very few realize until they, have, they no longer have it. Now, I've just done you a favor to fast forward your life to the last few days of your life. What, do you, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? When you look your current schedule, when you look your current calendars, when you look your current agenda, what are we going to do about it? Because our sons, our daughters, are not going to be three forever. They're not going to be 17 forever. They're not going to live in your house forever. Your grandchildren, they're not going to be cured forever. They're going to be annoying one day. <laughs> what are we going to do about it? I know that you will have some pushbacks. And you push back saying this, Mike, it's so easy to say that, but if I don't do as much I possibly can, I would never make it. I will never make it. But my question is this, what is it? What is it? What are we chasing? What are we working for? What are we, you know, working like from 9 until 9 p.m. for? What is it? If you ask those people in hospice, those men and women whom uh, Brawny asked, maybe they would say this, you better know what your it. You better make sure that your it is worth it. So because you don't want when you get to the end of your life and you realize it's a wrong it. Let's be honest, we are too busy to talk about that, to think about the it, right? You better, be know, you, you better know what this is if you're going to pack your life full of stuff, full of agenda, full of schedules to help you get to where it, where it is. What is it? Maybe you got it from your parents. The it, you got it from your parents because they were massively successful and you're intimidated. I have to be more than what my dad, my mom had. Or maybe they were massively failures. You don't want to be like them. I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be poor like them. I don't want to be like that. Or they were massively in the middle. Their lives are boring. You know, as a parent, you're always wrong, right? So just like that. Like, oh, you never get right. So I'm going to experience that one day. So somewhere along the way, we decide that what it is. And we begin working hard for it. And at the end of our life, I wish I didn't work so hard. Maybe you said, if I don't do as much as I possibly can, I would fall behind. Behind who? Who set the standard? Who set the standard? Did the culture set the standard for you? So you would fall behind? Uh, you know, I don't want my kids to fall behind. I don't want me to fall behind. I, don't want to keep, I want to keep up with who? Keep up with who? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves and answer it. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. If I don't do as much as I possibly can, I'd be poor. For some of you, this is a really big deal. You don't want to be poor. But let me ask you, did you know, did, did, have you ever stopped to think what is poor? The definition of poor. What is poor? What is rich? Maybe it's something you grew up with, something that you've heard. Maybe it's something you've seen. But most of you who are worried, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't do this, if I don't work hard, I'd be poor. You were never really... Th- thought that through. It's the, actually the emotion that drives you. Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. If I don't do as much as I possibly can, I won't be accepted. I won't be accepted. I, uh, who do you want to be accepted? Accepted by who? You know, I read the news one day that a guy, uh, a really smart guy, he, he's still in his mid-20s. He died because he worked and he didn't sleep for three days. He worked in a really um, prestige firm in New York, and he died because he, he didn't sleep for three days. At the end of the, you know, 10 more years from now, young people, those people that you want to please, maybe you will not have their phone numbers anymore. You won't even know that person anymore. Is it worth it? If, if I don't do as much as I possibly can, I won't measure up. Measure up to whom? 
What's driving you? Is it possible if you're not careful, if you don't sit down and think, if you don't answer some really important question, you could get to the stage of life when you begin to lose your health and you begin to regret. And especially this, if you're a Christian, do you know that God has an amazing plan for your life? If you stuff your calendar with all of your agenda, all of your uh, desires, and you didn't leave time for God to use you for His purpose, you would miss out a lot of things. God has amazing plan for you, for your kids, for your friend, for your wife, for your husband. Have you ever created a space? Have you ever created a margin in your life so that you would do something amazing for God? Young people, you have a lot of margins in your life. You don't have kids yet. You don't have wife. You don't have husband yet. You have a lot of margins. I want to encourage you. If you don't prioritize your time to do something for the kingdom of God, when you have family, don't even think that you would have time. If you don't do it now, you will never do it. God has something for all of us. Make sure, make sure we number our days. I want to close up with this application, how we do this. On your way out, you will receive a card like this. And I want you to go home and really think about what we're talking about today. God, teach us to number our days. Teach us to live as if our days are numbered so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When you go home, in light of my future, in light of my family, in light of the kingdom of God, what do I need to add into my calendar? What do I need to sub subtract from my calendar? What do I need to do less this year in 2014? What do I need to remove from my calendar? What do I need to remove? Maybe if last year you spent a lot of time doing Facebook or watching movies, maybe you can say, hey, hey, my time is really limited, isn't it? Maybe that's something that I need to subtract. Hey, you know what? I think I need to stop doing this so that I can do this more. Hey, I need to, I need to do this more often if I want to have quality time with my, my family. I have to do this more often. I want you to use this and put it in your diary, put it in your calendar. Hey, these are the things. Maybe you can put some names on it. You can put some, uh, your hobby maybe. Maybe, maybe you, need to, you need to reduce the hours you use for, to play golf. It's so easy for me to pick on golf because I don't play golf. But whatever it is, ask God. God, teach us, just like Moses, to number our days. Teach us to live as if our days are numbered. Two and a half years ago, when we talk about exactly the same thing about time, I... I challenge everybody, if you still remember, to think your life like a week. The Bible said you, you would have 70 years or 80 years if you're still strong, if you have strength. So if you would work together with me, if you would think Monday, one day is like 10 years, so zero to 10 is Monday. 11 to 20 is Tuesday. 21 to 30 is Wednesday. And, and 30 to 40 is Thursday. I want you to think about yourself. Which day are you in? I'm on Thursday. I'm 32 this year. I'm actually Thursday around 2 a.m. in the morning. And for some of you, you maybe some of you are on uh, public holiday, I mean like on <laughs> long weekend. You're actually Monday the next week. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. But the, the whole point is this, our time is limited. If I think that way, hey, I'm on Thursday, I still have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and that's it. Wow, that's not a lot. So let us 
live as if our days are numbered so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So we will know what to put on a calendar, what to leave out, what to remove from our calendar. Let us close our eyes together. Heavenly Father, thank you for designing us in such a way that you know what's best for us is to have margin in our lives to have free time so that we can do what's really important in our life. Without realizing it with the advanced technology that we have, so much information that we can access, we do things that is not as important. So Lord, help us this year. Just like what Moses said, we pray, teach us to number our days. My time is limited, so I need to limit how I spend my time. Lord God, remind us what the most important thing in life. Lord, you have called us. For those of us who are Christian here, God has called us to be his light in this world. God has put you into this local church to reach out to people, to your friends, to your neighbor. Have you created some margin for God to use your time, to use you mightily wherever you are? Young people, older people, male, female. Let us consider that 2014 will be the best year so far where I could manage my time better. Heavenly Father, help us to do that. And we know with your help, we can have an effective life. I don't know how many summers we will still have, how many more winters we will still have. But Lord, help us to enjoy every single season of life. Maybe right now some of us here are going through tough times. Maybe some of us are asking God why did you allow this to happen in my life why didn't you answer my prayer but God teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom help us to be able to appreciate every single season that you allow to happen in our lives as you have promised in Psalm 23 surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Church, why don't we just stand and as you go out, why don't we just think again for the next week and really apply this. I need to live as if my days are numbered. Why don't we just lift up your hands and receive God's blessing? May the Heavenly Father who loves you so much, who sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for all of us so that we may gain eternal life for those who believe. The God who created time, the God who is from eternity to eternity, from from everlasting to everlasting, He's the one who cares about our lives. May He give you wisdom. May He help us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May the Holy Spirit who lives with us, who lives inside of us, help us to know what's important, what's not important, and what is the most important priority in our lives. May the God who loves you be with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. Amen. Let's give God a big hand. God bless you, everybody. And next week, we're going to continue with the, the third part of Squeeze. God bless.